We are live. Howdy. Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I have grown to look forward to these live streams. Uh, I've done a couple on Friday afternoons. I uh, recently got home from work and got my clothes changed and was super excited uh, to jump online and spend some time with this global online village. It is hot outside here in Columbus, Ohio. I've got my sparkling water and I am ready for the MS challenge. So as you guys jump on, grab your water, and when I guzzle, you guzzle. This live stream today is going to be using that new format that I've been trying out. I'm going to deliver a didactic lecture on a topic in MS, and then I'm going to open things up for questions. Um, and today's topic is going to be on the highly effective disease-modifying therapies. So I'm going to be talking to you about Tysabri, Ocrevus, and Limtrata. Um, and that's what we're going to be discussing today. I'm going to share with you um, how those drugs work. I'm going to share with you eff efficacy, uh, what makes me think that they're highly effective. I'm going to share with you a little bit about the monitoring. Uh, and I'm also going to share with you some of the side effect profile and things that we need to be looking out for. So that's what we're going to be trying to do today. Uh, right now, there's 73 people that have jumped online. It warms my heart. And as you come online, of course, please share with me where you're calling in from. Uh, I adore uh, reading the post after the live stream and, and seeing this global online village as it grows and grows. And it really is just a wonderful thing. And so before I get rolling, can you guys hear me okay? Uh, let me know in the comments. I'm, I'm using my white microphone, which it should really provide better sound than last time. Um, can anybody comment on, let me just type, how is the sound? Okay, it, so so you're hearing me well. Uh, Andrea wrote, yes, hear you fine. I'm getting a thumbs up from Anne. Uh, this is exciting. There's folks from Ireland on, there's folks from Boston. Uh, very, very cool. Okay, so it sounds like the sound is good today. I, I love that. When I was going back through some of the older live streams, I realized that the sound quality wasn't as awesome, and I apologize for that. Um, as many of you know, I'm an MS neurologist. I'm a neuroimmunologist. I'm not an AV guy, um, and I've had a really steep learning curve uh, in, trying to, uh, in, tr in trying to tackle all of this. So let's jump into a didactic lecture, uh, and I'm going to be talking about highly effective disease-modifying therapies today. And I won't be reading the comments while I'm talking, but... After the lecture, I'm going to open it up for comments on that disease-modifying therapy. And I, I wanted to start with some general comments about disease-modifying therapies, what they're for, why we use them, what makes me feel that certain ones are highly effective, and what are the goals of using a disease-modifying therapy. So for starters, I want us to think about disease-modifying therapies like birth control pills. So Follow this logic. If you have three children and you start oral birth control, you still have three children. They don't go away just because you started taking birth control. And as a joke, I like to say to people, if you're wondering why you're on birth control, go hang out with your three children. You take birth control not to remove something that's already happened, the birth of your children. You take birth control to prevent an unplanned future event, an unplanned pregnancy in this example. If you have suffered an optic neuritis and you have only 50% vision in your left eye and you start a disease modifying therapy, you still only have 50% vision in your left eye. The disease modifying therapy can't give you back the brain damage that was caused leading to the loss of function. You take a disease modifying therapy because you don't want to have an optic neuritis in the other eye. And if you're left with, uh, let's say, a burning limb, you have an attack and there's some residual pain uh, with some burning sensation in your limb. Taking a disease-modifying therapy doesn't make the burning go away. Taking a disease-modifying therapy is a birth control pill against a future MS attack. It's a birth control pill against a future uh, MS spot on your MRI. And it's a birth control pill protecting against future disability. That's why we take DMTs. I bring this up to you guys because sometimes people with um, – MS, who started DMT, will come back at their follow-up visit and they'll say, Doc, it's not working. I don't feel any better. I've been doing what you asked. I've been taking this therapy and I don't feel better. And I have to help them understand that we're not taking a DMT to remove unpleasant symptoms. 
We're taking a DMT to prevent future bad events. Really, if you think about it this way, we need to channel the you 25 years from now. So if you're 30 with a new MS diagnosis, we need to think about the 55-year-old you. And the 55-year-old you doesn't want to have accrued neurological disability. She doesn't want to have deficits where she has problems walking or problems thinking or problems using her bladder. And she very much wants you at age 30 to take measures to protect her from that damage. And separate from that, we talk about symptomatic management. I have a bunch of videos on my channel here where I talk about treating symptoms. Treating symptoms is where we improve the quality of your life. So again, if you have that burning uh, numbness in your hand, I will give you a symptomatic medicine like Neurontin, Gabapentin, Lyrica. These are the medicines that I talked about in last week's live stream about neuropathic pain in MS. We would use those medicines to make the pain less, but we would use a disease modifying therapy in parallel so that we can protect you against future events. So I hope that helps our mind frame for understanding why we're talking about taking a DMT. Now, I want to make a couple comments on the goals of disease modifying therapy. This is really good. Um, the goals of disease modifying therapy. I like to start talking about life goals before we talk about MS DMT goals. And why is that? Well, I want us to set our sights in the future. I want you to think about what are your life goals? Do you want to climb Monte Picchu? Do you want to finish your master's degree? Do you want to get promoted to that level in your company that you've been looking at? Excuse me. Do you want to walk your daughter down the aisle on her wedding night? What are the things that you want to plan for in the future, your life goals? And actually, I would ask all of you listening in right now, if you're comfortable and if you know, type a comment and share with me a life goal. I want to climb Machu Picchu. I want to, I want to continue to walk with only using my cane. I want to swim every day of my life. I want to be able to walk on the beach with my wife 25 years from now. Share with me what some of those life goals are. The reason I think this exercise is very, very important is because it helps us remember why the hey, hey, we're taking these medicines. It helps us in our frame of mind think about the future and realize I'm taking this medicine, which may have some side effects, not to make me feel better. It's my birth control pill against future events to allow me to achieve that life goal in the future. And so share with me what some of those things are. I would love to hear. Um, it'll be really awesome for me later to read through the comments and hear from you guys what are some of your long-term life goals. Once we've clarified what those long-term life goals are, now I think we can turn our attention to DMT goals. And I am going to share for you what I think DMT goals should be. Treat to target NETA4. Now, NETA stands for, and I'm just typing this in, NETA stands for No Evidence of Disease Activity. All right, so what do I mean when I say treat to target? We're not just giving you a medicine airy-fairy, you know, just take it and see what happens. We want to treat to a target. So if you have high cholesterol, you, you take a statin medicine to lower your cholesterol, and you're treating to a target. You're going to check your blood and say, oh, it's still too high. We're going to give you more medicine to lower it. And we keep giving you medicines to drive down to that target. And there's a lot of diseases where we do that. For example, in diabetes, we treat to a target. We want to normalize hemoglobin A1C. We want to normalize fat, uh, blood sugar levels. We want to prevent end organ damage. In diabetes, that would be the eyes, the nerves, the kidneys. And so we want to treat to target when we treat MS with disease-modifying therapy. And the target that I embrace is NETA, NETA4. So NETA, no evidence of disease activity, is a way of saying that during the time period we're evaluating you, the goal is no attacks. The goal is no new spots on MRI. The goal is that your neurological examination doesn't worsen. And the goal is that your rate of brain volume loss, brain shrinkage or atrophy is at a normal healthy rate. So that is the target that we're treating for. Now, here's the deal. 
No MS medicine can achieve that all the time forever. It's true. In 2019, we don't yet have a, a particular therapy which can guarantee that for your life. And then that might make you say, well, then Dr. B, that's kind of a dumb goal if we can't ultimately achieve it. And, and I disagree with that. I want us to think about Meta as the sign that's up in that factory that says days since last accident. You know the sign and it's got a number ticker. And so every day there isn't an accident, uh, they flip a number. So there's five days with no accident, 10 days with no accident, 100 days with no accident, maybe you get a pizza party. If there's an accident, they don't close the factory down and fire everyone. They figure out what's wrong, they fix it, and then they set the clock back to zero. And so then they start over again. And if we're treating to a target with MS, if we set our sights on Meta 4, it allows us to know when we're failing that goal, and it allows us to take action to try to work towards that goal. Moreover, there is some research that I believe in that demonstrated that if you can hold someone in Meta, no evidence of disease activity, for a period of two years, the probability that their neuro exam stays the same seven years later is really high. It's like 70, 80%. To me, this speaks to the fact that it is a reasonable and in fact appropriate target. Another way to think about NEDA is uh, a basketball analogy. So I'm told that in March, there's this big, exciting basketball tournament where 64 different groups of young men all participate in this big tournament. And I imagine that at the beginning of the season, 64 coaches tell each team, boys, this year we're going to win national championships. I also envision that's the way coaches talk. And every coach is telling their team, we're going to win national championships. So you might think, well, wait, that's nonsense. 63 coaches are liars because only one team can win the tournament. And I would disagree with you. If the team plays to win, if they set their sights on a goal of hitting national championships and then they come in second in the nation, that's really good. If they set their sights, they set their goal at winning games to achieve national championship and they lose a game, they don't quit the team. They have to figure out what went wrong and they have to try to adjust it to work towards that goal. And that's what I think we need to be doing when we treat with disease modifying therapies. We need to treat to the target of metaphor, no attacks, no new spots, no change on neuro exam and normal rates of brain volume loss. And if you're not hitting those, that might mean that we need to change what we're doing. We might need to escalate your therapy to a more impactful therapy. We might need to bring other things on board. We might need to rehabilitate and et cetera, et cetera. And so I wanted to share that with you to help you level set how I think about using disease modifying therapies in MS. Now, just for fun, what if I take a couple questions about what I've shared so far? Well, let's try that out. Do any of you have any questions about what I've shared thus far? Any questions about um, thinking about uh, DMT as a birth control pill? Any questions about NETA-4 and why I think that's what we need to treat for? Um, any questions um, uh, so far about how I think we need to conceptually think about DMTs? So I'm checking out the live stream. Uh, there's people from Spain, this is so awesome. There's people from the UK, there's people from Indiana that are calling in. Hey, Megan, it's good to see you. Megan's one of our moderators. She's fantastic. Megan, thanks for being online and keeping everyone uh, happy and, and keeping the live stream clean. I really appreciate that. So I've got someone from Saudi Arabia, um, and Hamad is asking about spasms and spasticity. Um, I will um, point you to my playlist on this channel, Hamad. I have a bunch of videos on spasticity. Okay, I'm not hearing any questions at the moment um, about uh, the, what we've covered so far. So I'm going to launch in to the first of the highly effective DMTs. Now, in 2019, there are multiple MS medicines, which is a godsend. There's probably like 18 different formulations of various FDA-approved MS medicines that are available. And that's a lot of medicines. And they're not all equal. Some of the medicines can achieve goals better than others. And I think that some of the medicines are what I would refer to as mildly effective. I think some of the other medicines are moderately effective. 
And I think a couple of the medicines are highly effective. And I'm going to focus the next several minutes of our lives together talking about the highly effective medicines. Now, I actually have a, a video on this channel that I did a, a couple months ago where I shared with you straight out what I think is mild, moderate, and highly effective. So if you would like to look up that video, it'll, it'll spill the beans on my opinions about where I rank these medicines. But today, I'm going to talk about the three medicines that I consider to be highly effective. And those are the three monoclonal antibodies, the, the three infused drugs. Uh, names are natalizumab, which is the code name for Tysabri. There's uh, Ocrevus, which is Ocrelizumab. And there's Limtrata, which is Alentuzumab. And so the next part of this didactic live stream is going to be talking about each of those medicines. So let's start talking about natalizumab or Tysabri. And I want you to look at how the word is spelled. So I'm going to write it out here for you. Nata. Okay. So look at the way, <coughs> excuse me, look at the way that I've spelled that word. Um, and, I've, and I've divided it up. And I want you to read that word backwards with me, literally. If you read that word backwards, it tells you a lot about the medicine. The first two letters, if you read it backwards, are AB. So AB stands for Aaron Boster. No, I'm joking. AB stands for antibody. Antibody. And an antibody is a biologic key. So I don't have a key in my pocket. I should have brought one and held it up and said, see this key? How many doors does this key unlock? And then you would probably say, well, one. We fit one key for one door. And an antibody is like a biologic key in that it has a very, very specific target in the body. Another way of thinking about an antibody is it's like a smart bomb where it's going to target and find one thing. What's interesting about antibodies is they cannot interact with anything but their target. So if you have an antibody against green and you put it in a, a pool of blue, it won't do anything because it can only identify green. And that's a silly color example. Natalizumab, as you see the word AB, is an antibody. Now the M means monoclonal. And a monoclonal antibody, or a MAB, is when you take one antibody and you make a million bazillion copies of it. So when you're holding a bag of Tysabri, it's one antibody and there's a million copies of it. Uh, uh, that would be, if I use the key analogy, you take your one key to your door and you take it to the hardware store and they make, you know, 700,000 copies of it. So now you have a giant trash bag full of a bunch of versions of that one key. And that is what a monoclonal antibody is. And Tysabri is a monoclonal antibody. Now, the next part, again, we're reading the word backwards. Nada, the, zu, mab. So if you look at the next two letters, Z-U. Z-U in science language means that this drug is humanized. So ZU, I'm just writing this down in the comments, means humanized. Humanized. When you make an antibody in a laboratory, you typically make a mouse antibody, right? So you're making the antibody out of mouse protein. And if you take the mouse protein and inject it into the human, the human's immune system gets really sassy. It doesn't like receiving foreign protein or foreign DNA. And you can have reactions to the antibody. And so what they did with Tysabri, the ZU that you see, tells you that this monoclonal antibody has been humanized. Now, the next part is LI. And LI means immune target. So LI tells us that natalizumab, Tysabri, was invented to treat an immune target. And so that's really uh, kind of a cool thing. Natalizumab is one of very few drugs that was originally invented to treat MS. Most of the MS drugs were invented to treat other things, and then they were discovered that they worked in MS. This drug was invented to treat an immune target, and specifically multiple sclerosis, which is kind of cool. Now, NADA doesn't have any uh, meaning to my knowledge. NADA might be someone's name or something. But Tysabri, natalizumab, is a humanized monoclonal antibody. And it's a smart bomb. And so now we simply need to talk about what does it identify? When you infuse Tysabri into someone's arm, what is that antibody looking for? And it's looking for 
the VLA4 receptors. So that's kind of science-y. So th what it's really doing is it's looking for the receptors that allow – sorry, I'm checking my phone out here. Um, it, it, uh, it's looking for the receptors that are involved in allowing white blood cells to cross the blood-brain barrier. So if this is the blood-brain barrier and over here is the bloodstream and over here is the brain, the naughty autoreactive white blood cells in the bloodstream have to cross the blood-brain barrier to get in the brain. This blood-brain barrier, the way they get across is they use these VLA4 receptors. So when you give someone Tysabri, you, you bind up the VLA4 receptors and you make them not work. And so it's kind of like if you took that key that I was referring to and you encased it in lucite, you know, now it's inside of this, you know, this uh, see-through, you know, lucite and, and it doesn't work anymore. You can hold the key, but it won't fit in the door. And when you give someone Tysabri, what you're kind of doing is you're tightening up the blood brain barrier. You're making it impenetrable so that the naughty white blood cells over in the bloodstream, they can't cross into the central compartment. They're, they're trapped, and that's the way Tysabri works. Now, we give Tysabri once a month, and after three monthly infusions of Tysabri, you have bound up all those receptors. And as long as you keep taking Tysabri every four to six weeks, you're going to maintain what I call the Great Wall of China, because that's what Tysabri does. It creates this massive Great Wall of China so that none of the autoreactive cells can get it. Now, Tysabri came out in 2004, so think about that for a second. It's not a new drug. It's been around for many, many years now. Um, and Tysabri remains one of the top three medicines from an efficacy standpoint used to treat MS. It was studied a long time ago, obviously, and back then they did placebo-controlled trials. They didn't compare the drug against an active comparator the way they do now. They compared it against placebo. And against placebo, it was very, very impressive with something like a 68% re reduction in relapses compared to placebo and a 42% reduction in disability progression, and it cleaned up the MRI really fiercely. It was a really exciting day, and it remains very exciting as we try to use Tysabri to hit NETA, to hit no attacks, no new spots, no change on, on exam, those goals. And it is considered a highly effective medicine. Now, when you think about natalizumab and you think about the highly effective nature of it, I don't hear a lot of people arguing over whether or not it's a good medicine from an efficacy standpoint. I really don't hear people talk about that because Tysabri is highly effective. And I think the community of MS treaters absolutely recognizes that. Excuse me. But we have to think about the safety and tolerability. So let's talk about that for a second. Tolerability is your ability to put up with receiving the therapy, and to some extent, the doctor's uh, ability to put up with you taking the therapy. I mean, you know, because we're a team. And so we think about is it tolerable for everybody? And Tysabri is given once every four to six weeks. And so that means that every four to six weeks, you have to go to an infusion center and give them your arm and they run in the Tysabri. It takes an hour to take the Tysabri and then you can go. And the rest of the month, you kind of do your thing. I think that that's pretty tolerable. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I'm going to talk to you about some other therapies in a second that are less frequent than that. But coming in once a month, I don't think is a, a deal breaker for most people. For some, it is because they can't get off work or they travel too much. Um, but most people that I've worked with over the years can find a, a, a couple hours each month to come in and be infused at an infusion center. Another way of thinking about tolerability is, is how it makes you feel. And Tysabri is not a very challenging infusion to receive, meaning that people generally don't feel yucky when they're getting Tysabri. It's not like um, 1980s style chemo where, you know, you get it and, and you know, it whoops your tush. Um, Tysabri is generally very well tolerated, I would say, as far as receiving the infusion. Now, the other piece to this is the safety piece. And Tysabri is processed by liver. And so my partners and I, we check liver enzymes once or twice a year. But, but it's really not something where we see problems with liver or kidneys or other organ systems. There's really one major concern or safety concern as it relates to Tysabri, and that's a risk of an infection, PML. And so PML is a demyelinating infection. 
It's an infection that can attack your brain and it can be fatal in about 20% of the time. Fatal death, scary. And people can survive a PML infection. If they don't die, a lot of times they have some degree of neurological disability. I have a couple of videos on the channel where I decode um, the JC virus antibody test and I, and I teach you about PML. And so I'm not going to jump into a long discussion about that. I'll just say a little bit. And then if there's questions, we can talk about it later. When we are considering putting someone on Tysabri, we have to think about a couple things. Number one, have they been exposed to the JC virus? And so you can actually check someone's blood and look for antibodies against the JC virus. And that's the JC virus antibody test. And if it's negative, that means that you haven't been exposed to the JC virus, which means in that moment, you can't get the infection PML. It's kind of like saying, if you haven't been exposed to HIV, you can't have AIDS. So we can test your blood and find out if your JC virus antibody negative or positive. And if you're negative, then we feel confident that there isn't really a, a risk beyond a theoretical risk of getting PML. Sorry, just real quickly, I want to see. Um, sorry about that, guys. The second thing we have to think about, oh, let me go back to if you're antibody negative. If you're antibody negative, we typically check your level or check to see every three months to see if you convert and become positive. And we don't really know how people contract JC virus. It may be through the air, um, but it, we're not sure about how we contract it. And there isn't really any precautions that you can take to prevent yourself from getting it. And the conversion rate from being negative to positive is somewhere about 5% a year. Some studies say it's higher than that, like upwards of 20% a year. But whatever the percentage is, we're still checking you. And we're checking every three months. And if you go from negative to positive, well, then that changes the conversation. Now, it is not a rule that you're not allowed to have Tysabri if you're antibody positive. And I bring that up because I've heard patients say, well, my doctor said I'm not allowed to have it because I'm antibody positive, which is false. It's not that you're not allowed to have it. It's not illegal. It's not unethical. But there's a risk associated with it. And that ri risk is of that fatal infection, that PML infection. And so the second thing we have to ask is if you're antibody positive, if you've been exposed to the virus, the JC virus, have you ever had prior chemo? So if you've had prior immunosuppression, Celsep, Imuran, if you've had Lymtrata or Cytoxin or Rituxan, probably Ocrevus, if you've had these kind of immunosuppressants, it increases the risk of getting PML if you're antibody positive. And so we need to know, have you been exposed to immunosuppression or not? And that actually changes which tables we look at when we're calculating your risk. The third thing that we need to look at is how long you've been on Tysabri. And there are some tables, and I actually have put them in my video before, where I show you that each year on Tysabri, if you're antibody positive, that risk goes up a little bit. And so the first year, if you're antibody positive, the risk of contracting PML is actually really low. It's between a hundredth and a thousandth of a percent. It's kind of low. And it can go up. And the highest risk category that we've seen is a 1.3% risk. And that's someone who's a high positive, um, had prior chemo and a bunch of other, they've been on drug for several years. So that's a skinny on Tysabri. And so let me just take pause and uh, see if there's questions here. Um, Megan actually writes in, if I understand correctly, becoming JC virus antibody positive is an exposure that randomly happens. That's correct, Megan. Absolutely. Um, to non-MSers, it's no big deal. That's also correct, spot on. For people with MS, it can pose a small risk of PML for those that have MS. That's correct. That's exactly right. And really, we want to focus that discussion on as it relates to Tysabri. So that was a great question. I appreciate that. Let me now shift gears, and I want to talk to you about the second drug that I consider to be highly effective. So we're talking about highly effective DMTs here. We've talked about natalizumab, Tysabri. Now we're going to talk about ocrelizumab or ocrevus. So again, if we write the scientific word out and we spell it backwards, it can teach you a lot about how the drug works. So let's do that together. Ocrelizumab. So if you look at that word backwards, guys, the last three letters are MAB, monoclonal antibody. And so the same explanation that I provided just a few moments ago for Tysabri, it applies here also. Ocrevus 
is a monoclonal antibody. And so it's a biologic antibody, a smart bomb, and they made a bunch of copies of it. And that's what you learn with MAB. ZU, just like we learned with Tysabri, ZU means that it's humanized. So they took this molecule and they took out as much mouse protein as possible and they put in as much human protein as possible. Now, LI, just like with natalizumab, tells you that this drug was invented for an immune target. And so it was originally tested in lupus and in MS. This drug was developed to be tested uh, in an immune target. Now, okra is a delicious vegetable, which you can fry and, and uh, serve in the South. Uh, and I think it's really, really tasty. Um, I don't think okra has any semantic meaning as it relates to this. And so now that we understand that this is a humanized monoclonal antibody, we simply need to know what's the target. So with Tysabri, the target was the blood-brain barrier, tightening it up. With Ocrevus or Ocrelizumab, the target's very different. It's adult B cells. And so when you take, uh, when you take Ocrelizumab in your body, it, it finds adult B cells. The, the antibody can't see the baby stem cells. It can't see the plasma cells. It can't really see the T cells. It can't really see all the other types of white blood cells or other parts of your body. It can only see the B cells. And when it finds the B cells, it causes them uh, through this thing called complement to die. So it kills off the adult B cells. Now this drug is given every six months because it takes six months to grow back your B cells. And let me explain to you the analogy that I like to use to help you understand how ocrelizumab works. With Tysabri, I think it's like thinking about the Great Wall of China. With Ocrevus, it's a bit different. And I, I want you, uh, to think about it along with me this way. When I went to high school here in uh, Gahanna, Ohio, which is a suburb of Columbus, it was a really big school, 700 some kids per class. And I joked that if two young men bumped into each other in the hallway and had a disagreement, there was only one way to solve said disagreement. And it was to meet behind the building at 3.30 and beat the crap out of each other. And I attended a few of these events uh, as I was in high school. And one of the things that I noticed was no young pugilist, no young boxer shows up to spar after school without six of his closest friends. So you don't go to get in a fight after school without bringing your posse along. And that group of guys that comes with you, they're going to get you riled up and you go whoop his butt, man. I got you. You can beat him. I know you can. I'll hold your book back. And if a young kid showed up to fight and none of his friends came, well, he'd probably go home. He wouldn't fight that day. Suddenly, he's just not motivated enough to fight. The analogy, the, the fighter, the kid that's fighting, that's the T cell that's attacking your brain and spinal cord. The friends are the B cells. So what we do with Ocrevus is we murder all your friends. So in the absence of having the B cells, we can't stimulate the T cell adequately to get riled up to go attack you. And we think that's one of the major mechanisms of how Ocrelizumab slows down MS. It does it by indirectly affecting the T cells by making them not able to become co-stimulated or adequately activated to get riled up and then go attack. Um, and so that's kind of interesting. Ocrelizumab is an infused drug. It takes longer to take okra than Tysabri. So Tysabri is about an hour infusion. Ocrelizumab can be like four hours. And the first infusion we break in half. So we give you half, then two weeks later, we give you the other half. And then it's once every six months. And so in between, you're not doing anything. You get infused, and then six months later, you come back. And that is a really infrequent infusion schedule. Uh, I find that to be uh, even more tolerable than a monthly infusion, only having to come in uh, once every six months. At my center, where I work, uh, with a bunch of really awesome MS docs at Ohio Health, um, we have an infusion center in our clinic. And so we like to see patients during their infusions. So I joke that we can have MS twice a year. You come in, get the MRI in the morning, go sit in the infusion chair. And during the infusion, we can come back and see you. Or after your infusion, you can pop into clinic. And it, it's a kind of a cool schedule. And I think that that frequency is one of the things that makes ocrelizumab kind of attractive to a lot of people. From a uh, efficacy standpoint, ocrelizumab is a highly effective therapy. Um, ocrelizumab is one of the most modern drugs that's come out for MS. 
And what that means is it used a modern clinical trial design where they compared it not against placebo, but against a known active comparator. And so that's really cool. And the, the active comparator that they compared it to was Rebif. And so Rebif is one of the interferon drugs. It's uh, considered a first-line drug. I consider it to be mildly effective. It's been around since about 95 or 97. And they, in the clinical trials, pitted Ocrevus against Rebif. And Ocrevus did a lot better than Rebif. It outperformed on attack rate by 45%. It outperformed on disability progression by about 40-some percent. And it decreased MRI activity by over 90% or 95% better than Rebif. And so it really demonstrated that in a head-to-head Pepsi Coke challenge, that it was a superior medicine. And this is one of the highly effective drugs. Now, when we talk about safety tolerability, I already made a comment about the tolerability of the frequency of being infused. The first infusion, there's about a 30% chance of an infusion reaction. And that would be like red rash, itchy throat, uh, joint aches, headaches, stuff like that. Now, most of them are mild to moderate. There's been no fatal infusion reactions to my knowledge. And what's really interesting is subsequent infusions are less uh, problematic. The body acclimates to the infusion reaction, and it's called a cytokine release phenomenon. So that's a lot of crazy doctor words. But essentially, with subsequent infusions, your body handles it better. So the risk of having an infusion reaction goes from about 30% down around 8% thereafter. And I'll share with you that having used some Ocrevus in our infusion center, it's generally a well-tolerated therapy. Now, Ocrevus, interestingly, is not metabolized. It it doesn't get processed by your liver or your kidneys. And as a result, you don't need to check those laboratories. It's catabolized. So that's with a C. Catabolism is where it just dissolves in the bloodstream. And we don't need to do um, any monitoring for that. There's two things that we need to be thinking about. When the drug was launched, there was a question about breast cancer. And I think the answer is it doesn't cause breast cancer. We now have 100,000 people that have taken Ocrevus for about two and a half years post-marketing and no further cases of breast cancer have been seen. And and so I'm very reassured by that. Um, And I'm not going to get into the details of that story because I think the punchline is it doesn't cause breast cancer. But one of the things that it's prompted me to do as a doctor is to recommend and to remind my my patients that they should have breast exams once a year. And so I think that's just good management. And the reality is I'm not going to do breast exams on my patients. So I want to make sure that an appropriate doctor is. Not because I think there's an increased risk with okra. I actually think that's just good, solid medicine. If, God forbid, we were to learn years from now that there actually was a small cancer signal, my patients will have been monitored and screened, and that makes me feel reassured. The other thing that I want us to think about with Ocrevus is what it's doing is it's driving down some of the B cells, and we can see certain antibody levels drop a bit. And generally speaking, that is not a problem. Rarely, rarely, it could increase the risk of infections, specifically upper respiratory tract infections and urinary tract infections. And so the way that I tend to deal with this is if you're on Ocrevus and you're having recurrent infections, like in a year you have four bouts of bronchitis, God forbid, well, we're probably going to take you off that drug. Now we can order some special laboratories and we can actually see your antibody levels. Um, And we can get a sense of have they gone uh, low or have they not gone low? And so those are the considerations to Ocrelizumab. Um, It's a highly effective drug like natalizumab. So we talked about Tysabri. Now we've talked about Ocrevus. And so I'm going to jump into the third uh, highly effective drug, and this is Lymtrata or Alentuzumab. I've got another can of this delicious sparkling water, and I'm going to write out the the word Alentuzumab. And so if you look at this word backwards, guys, MAB, again, we're dealing with a monoclonal antibody. So all three of these highly effective drugs are biologic agents. They're all monoclonal antibodies or smart bombs. And whereas Tysabri's target was the blood-brain barrier and Ocrevus' target was adult B cells, Limtrata, Alemtuzumab, has a different target, which I'll get to here in a second. If you look at the word reading backwards, ZU means humanized. 
So all three of these drugs have been humanized. And you see TU. Now, the other ones had LI, which meant it was an immune target. TU tells you that this drug was originally invented to treat a form of cancer. So this drug was originally invented to treat a form of blood cancer. And it was developed under a different name, CAMPATH, because it was developed in Cambridge Pathology. And so they called it CAMPATH. And the drug has been uh, used in, in MS in a very different manner. With CAMPATH, they give much, much higher doses and they give it subcutaneously. When we're using Lemtrada, Alemtuzumab for MS, we don't give it sub-Q, we give it IV, and we give it in a very different manner, in a different schedule, at a much, much different dose. And so it's kind of, in my mind, two separate things. And so in order to understand uh, what it does, we have to know what the target of the antibody is. And the target of this antibody is adult B and T cells. And so whereas ocrelizumab targets adult B cells, Limtrada, alemtuzumab targets adult B and T cells. And it, it, when it identifies the adult B and T cell, it kills them. And then something kind of weird and cool happens. The, the pluripotent stem cells, the baby B and T cells, they grow back differently. The way I think about it is as follows. MS patients have an imbalance in their immune response. They have a very inflammatory immune response with lots of inflammatory cells and very few regulatory cells. So think about like cops and robbers or cops and guys that go out and brawl. In the MS patient, there's very few cops and a lot of brawlers. And when you give them Trata, you actually kill both. But when they grow back, the cops grow back bigger than the brawlers. The regulatory components of the cells come back more robustly. And that's really interesting because what you're doing essentially isn't blocking something. You're retraining the immune response. You're trying to reboot the immune response to behave differently. Which brings me to my first point, which is unlike Tysabri and Ocrevus, which are continuous therapies. You, you take Tysabri every four to six weeks. You take Ocrevus every six months, every, actually every five to six months. With Lentrada, you take five days in a row wait a year, and then you take three days in a row, and then we don't plan to retreat you unless you have a bad outcome. And I'll clarify what I mean by that. So after you've had the five days in a row, you wait 12 months, you wait a full year, then you get three days in a row, and everyone gets that. And I refer to that as a complete induction, because that's what Lemtrada is. You're inducing the immune system to change. After that, we don't treat you, because we've rebooted the immune response. And we don't retreat you unless you have two new spots on an MRI or a new clinical attack. And so if you have two new spots on an MRI or a clinical attack after Lemtrada, then we discuss whether or not it's appropriate to give a third course of Lemtrada. Well, we have data going out eight years. So there are people with MS who have volunteered their bodies to receive Lemtrada in an experiment and then to continue on Lemtrada well, they're not continuing on Lemtrada. They're continuing to be followed up to eight years now. And so when we look at those people with MS in the clinical trials, 50% of them never got retreated. So they got the five days, they waited a year, they got the three days, and then they went seven more years and they never had another attack and they never had uh, new spots on their MRI. And that's really amazing. That's 50%. Now, 30% needed a third round. So meaning they got the five days, waited a year, three days, and then sometime in the next seven years, they had an attack or two new spots and they got a third round. And then 13% got a fourth round. And so Lemtrada is rather different in that it's not a medicine that necessarily needs to be redosed. Now, just like with Ocrevus, Lemtrada is a newer medicine. And instead of testing it against placebo, the way that we did with Tysabri back in the ancient day, is we tested Lemtrada against Rebif. So Lemtrada was compared against Rebif, just like Ocrevus was compared against Rebif. And Lemtrada outperformed Rebif when you look at disability progression and when you look at MRI. And when you look at, excuse me, when you look at attack rate. The MRI uh, had some uh, mixed results, actually, with Lemtrada. I am very impressed with Lemtrada's ability to work on brain volume. I'm also very impressed with ocrelizumab's ability to work on brain volume. I think that Tysabri's ability to work on brain volume isn't as good as the other two, and that's my opinion reviewing the data. Now, when you talk about tolerability of Lemtrada, it's the roughest of the three. It's the hardest to tolerate. You, during those five days, 
93% of people have infusion reactions, and some of them can be very unpleasant. Now, the way that you manage infusion reactions is you give medicines ahead of time to prep them for it. And we do that with ocrelizumab, and we do that with Lemtrada. So with Lemtrada, we're giving you steroids, and we're giving you acetaminophen, Tylenol, we're giving you Benadryl, we're typically giving you something like Zyrtec. We're giving you a lot of medicines to get your body ready to tolerate the Lemtrada. And that's a, a difference from the other two monoclonals, because the other two monoclonals have a better track record of tolerability when you receive it. The other thing that we have to think about are some of the other side effects. And there's really three other major side effects with Lentrada. The second one is it can cause autoimmunity, which is very weird. And I want to explain it to you. When you kill the adult B and T cells with Lentrada, you don't grow them back on the same day. The B cells come back first around six to nine months. Then the, the CD8 cells come back around, say, one year. And the CD4 cells can take over a year to come back. It's called a differential return. It's kind of an imbalance. And because there's this imbalance, I think that sets you up for a risk of autoimmunity. So there's a very high risk of having a thyroid autoimmunity where you develop a autoimmune thyroid problem. It's 43% if you look over eight years. Now, you don't need your thyroid to live and you can take care of it oftentimes with a pill, but that doesn't make it okay. It's still, you know, you might really like your thyroid. I like my thyroid. And, and so that's something that people have to grapple with. There is a 2% risk, which is a low risk, of having immune thrombocytopenia. And that's a very, theoretically, you could bleed to death. And it's not real fast, but that doesn't matter. I mean, this is scary, a scary concept. Fortunately, there's a way to monitor patients. And it's actually pretty straightforward to, to treat ITP. We can just give steroids, and most of the time, that takes care of it. Uh, and that's one of the things we have to screen for. The third autoimmune condition is that of the kidneys. And there's a 0.3%, so a third of a percent risk of causing a kidney autoimmunity. There's been some case reports of, of hepatitis autoimmunity where the liver can become inflamed. And so that's the, the third category. We talked about infusion reactions. We talked, um, well, I guess the second one, autoimmunity. The third category will be infection. And there's an increased risk of having a shingles outbreak the first month after Lentrata. And so what we do is when someone receives Lemtrada, we give them acyclovir or valcyclovir, which are antiviral medicines that protect them against getting a shingles outbreak. Now, the European and South American labels say that you do the, the acyclovir for one month or maybe two months. I don't remember. The American label says that you stay on it until the, the CD4 count goes above 200, which can take about 10 months. And so essentially for the, the first two years, most of those first two years, you're taking a cyclovir to prevent having um, a shingles outbreak. The, the other infection that we have to worry about is listeria. So listeria is a foodborne pathogen, like a food poisoning kind of thing. And you have an increased risk of developing listeria. And so we want to implement what I refer to as the pregnancy diet, where you avoid unwashed fruits and vegetables, raw meats. Um, unpasteurized cheeses, deli meats, stuff like that, a month before Lemtrada, and then for a while after Lemtrada. A month before, because if you eat some camembert cheese that's been spoiled and it, it's got some listeria, that can kind of sit latent in your stomach or in your gut um, for upwards of a month before it can manifest. And we keep people on a uh, the so-called pregnancy diet for several months after they take Lemtrada. Now, the fourth category of risk is a very low risk, but it's a very scary word, cancer. There's a, a third, 0.3% risk of skin cancer. And just like I'm not doing breast exams on my patients, I'm not looking at my patients naked. I don't want to uh, do a naked exam on my patients. So I send the Lemtrada treated patients once a year to the naked doctor who writes me a letter and says, Dear Aaron, the skin looks fine. And I think that's great. And the reason that's important is because even though it's a 0.3% chance, a very low percent chance, I don't want to take that risk with someone. And so if we can look at their skin and we identify that there's an area where there's concern for skin cancer, if you catch it early, you can cut it out. You can cure it. And so that makes me feel reassured that it's something you can screen for and treat. There's a 0.3% risk of thyroid cancer, which is actually the risk in the MS population, believe it or not. And there's a 0.2% risk, so a fifth of a percent of a type of blood cancer, lymphoma. And so that's a skinny on the good, the bad, and the ugly as it relates to Lemtrada. I've now been talking for about 50 minutes, and the focus of today's discussion is on disease-modifying therapies. 
I started off reminding you what they're for, uh, using an analogy that they're a birth control pill to prevent future bad events. And I shared with you why I use them the goals of disease modifying therapy, which is treating specifically to the target. And for me, that's net of four, no evidence of disease activity, meaning no new spots, no attacks, no change on exam, normal brain volume loss. That's the goal that we're shooting for. And I went over three of the MS disease modifying therapies, the three that in my opinion are the most efficacious talking to you about what they are, these monoclonal antibodies that have specific targets, Tysabri targets the blood brain barrier, Ocrevus is targeting the adult B cells. Lemtrada is targeting the adult B and T cells. And we talked a little bit about the data supporting why they're highly effective. And I went over some safety and tolerability. So that will conclude the didactic portion, but please don't jump off the live stream. There's 159 of you. There was 160, I guess one person jumped off. And what I would like to do now is open up the lines. Excuse me. I want to open up the lines and I want to take your questions. So I ask that in this format, we limit questions to what we just talked about. So disease modifying therapy questions. Um, and if we're going to talk specifically about drugs, I ask that we talk about uh, the three drugs that I've mentioned. And I also want to remind you that I can't provide a diagnosis or treat you on the interwebs. So when you ask the question, please make sure that it's a general question. In other words, don't say I'm on Tysabri and I have this JC virus. And so what does that mean for me? because I can't answer that on the internet. But if you said in someone who's on a JC virus, what are the considerations, you know, that kind of conversation I can have. So let's start to look at uh, the disease modifying therapy questions in this live stream. Uh, question, uh, Kim Kreider writes, any reason to change from rituxan to ocrevus? So rituxan is another monoclonal antibody. So it's a, it's a biologic agent, it's a smart bomb, and it has the same target as ocrevus. It goes after adult B cells. Now the way rituxan kills adult B cells is slightly different than ocrelizumab. It does it slightly differently. And they're not the same drug. They're very similar drugs. And so we have uh, looked at giving someone rituxan or ocrevus. Rituxan is not on label for MS. And in most states outside of Colorado, it's really hard to get it paid for because it's off label. And therefore, the insurance payers are typically disinclined to cover it, whereas Ocrevus is on label. And so what we have found here in sunny Ohio is that most people with MS can get Ocrelizumab comfortably covered by their insurance and, and therefore paid for. Rituxan, not so much. I would say that medically, I don't know that there's a big difference if you're on one or the other as far as the outcomes. Now we have way more data on Ocrevus. We know more about Ocrevus and how it works in MS, but that's a very interesting question. And if someone, for example, hypothetically was forced to switch from one to the other, I wouldn't be nervous neurologically that they were gonna have breakthrough disease. So I hope that answers your question. That was a really good one. Thank you for asking. Let's see, there are some other questions. So, Lita writes in, Dr. Boster, have any of your patients ever had a case of asymptomatic PML? No. So I have taken care of someone referred to the hospital, not our patient, but someone else's patient um, who had PML and he died. And that was a terrible experience. Um, I diagnosed the PML and the next day he was dead. Um, and so he was obviously very symptomatic leading up to that. Um, it, it's a very interesting point that you bring up because if you identify abnormalities on the MRI that are consistent with PML and the person hasn't had symptoms yet, that's called asymptomatic PML. And those people do much, much better long term than symptomatic PML. And this is part of the reason why it's important to get MRIs when you're on Tysabri. You're going to get an MRI because you're going to monitor for new MS spots, but you're also going to get an MRI to make sure that you're not seeing lesions that look like PML lesions. Which brings me to the point that you have to make sure that the neurologist and the radiologist know the difference and know what to look for. And it can be tricky. Um, and, but, but to answer your question directly, no, I have not had cases. I have helped consult on several cases of PML uh, around the country, uh, both symptomatic and asymptomatic, uh, but I have not had a case of asymptomatic PML. All right, so what else do we have going on here? Any other questions? I'm trying to read the question. Here's one. So, haha, kitty MS. 
which is a pretty cool name, writes in from Florida. So hello from sunny Florida. Um, what does mild global brain atrophy really mean? Physical, physically, mentally. I always moved from Tecfidera to Tysabri when my MRI indicated atrophy after two and a half years. JC virus positive forced me on to Ogervis in January. So what I'm going to interpret this question to ask is what does it mean to have brain atrophy? So our bodies are programmed to get old and then eventually die. Everybody dies. And our bodies are programmed to kind of wear out. So an easy, ex an easy example is as you age, your skin gets thinner. Like literally, like you have thinner skin. And as you age, you, you, you get shorter because you're, the bones in your neck actually can shorten. And that's stuff that's kind of supposed to happen over time. And the brain is supposed to shrink. After the age of 18, there is a, um, a, a known phenomenon where brains slowly a little bit shrink each year. But they don't shrink very much. Um, and the issue here is in untreated MS, you can see brain shrinkage that's sometimes 10 times faster than the general population. Now, to answer your question, brain volume loss atrophy correlates with long-term disability, correlates with cognitive impairment, and correlates with physical disability. And those are all scary, bad things. Now, it doesn't mean that if you have bad brain atrophy, you're guaranteed to have that happen, but you're much more likely to. And when we see someone who has brain volume loss at an accelerated rate, it makes us concerned and it makes me want to be more aggressive in their therapy. What we would ideally like to do is put someone on the most effective drug that they're comfortable with as early as possible to prevent accelerated brain atrophy. That was a great question and thank you for asking it. And I love the, the name Haha -ha Kitty MS. All right. Let's take a look at some other questions. So here's a question from Inga F. Which DMT is considered stronger than Ocrevus? Well, what I would say to you is that I think Limtrata, Ocrevus, and Tysavri are the three most effective medicines in the NS armamentarium. And I have an opinion about their order, but other doctors don't always agree with me. And I'm going to leave it in this live stream that the three of them sit on the top shelf as being amongst the most effective medicines. And if you were on one and it wasn't working out, I would consider going on another one in that same tier. It's kind of like talking about cars and arguing over whether a Ferrari is better than a Lamborghini. They're both really, really good cars. Or it would be like going to a bar and looking at the top shelf booze and saying, well, Tito's is better than Belvedere. No, 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 Belvedere is better than Tito's. If you're thinking about these three monoclonal antibodies, you're thinking about the three most effective drugs that I'm aware of to treat, uh, to treat MS. And sorry, my phone is uh, going off. And so let's take a couple other questions before we wrap up this live stream. Question, is Lymtrata, so Anne McNabb writes, is Lymtrata essentially a cure for some people then? And the answer is no, it is not a cure. I think that for some people, it helps them achieve remission. I have a video on this channel where I talk about, should we start to use the word remission? And I'm going to define remission for you. Um, not a definition I made up. This is a definition I looked up in the dictionary. It's actually the oncology definition of remission. It's when you have no disease activity for five years off of therapy. And so you imagine in the setting of cancer, God forbid you have a cancer and you get treated and then you're cancer free, and then you go five years w without being treated again and with no evidence of cancer. They call that remission. It doesn't mean you're cured because the cancer can come back. And if we use the same analogy with Lymtrata, if you are receiving Lymtrata five days, wait a year, three days, and then you go five years not on a therapy and have no disease activity, I think we should be allowed to use the same term, remission. But it doesn't mean that you're cured and you can still have disease activity and you still need monitored. Um, I don't think that we have anything right now, including stem cell transplant. We have nothing right now that creates a cure. But I think that some of our medicines are getting really, really effective. And the fact that we can have a conversation about remission in and of itself is just absolutely amazing to me. So these are great questions, guys. Uh, here's a question from Carla. 
So Carla writes, is it common assumption that Ocrevus is a chemo drug? True or false? Uh, wait. Which um, could it be possible to feel better when you are closer to infusion since your B cells are coming back? So that's two really good questions, Carla. So Ocrevus is a monoclonal antibody, and it's not invented to treat cancer. So we wouldn't call it um, a cancer agent. Here's the issue with, with, with what we're talking about. We think of chemo typically as 1980s cytoxin, which is like napalm and just lays waste to all the cells, chemotherapy. But in reality, the, increasingly, the kind of chemotherapy we use to treat cancers is biologic monoclonal antibodies, like the drugs that we just talked about. So is Ocrevus a chemo? No and yes. Rituxan, which is a cousin of Ocrevus, very similar to Ocrevus, Rituxan is used to treat certain forms of cancer. But the, the issue here is what we mean by chemo. I don't think that's a, a very helpful term, to be very honest with you. I think it's more helpful to talk about what the drug's doing. Because in this example, Ocrevus isn't like napalm. It doesn't just burn the village to the ground. It's, a, it's like a smart bomb. It's, it's a very, very specific target. Now, the next question is really fascinating as well, where you said, is it possible that it's wearing off? Uh, and so I'll share with you some very interesting data that was presented at the AAN, um, at the American Academy of Neurology. And it was looking at whether or not some people have a return of their B cells faster than others. And it looks like that it, it may be related to body habitus, so how big you are. And what they found was amongst people that had a higher BMI, they were bigger humans, they tend to have, not all of them, but they tended to have a faster return of the B cells. And it's interesting in clinic that we have noticed that some patients tell us that they don't feel as well that last month. And in a few of them, we've actually checked their B cells and they had come back. Now, the Ocrevus label allows you to treat every five to six months. Not every six months, but every five to six months. And so what we've done in some cases is we start to give the drug at five months instead of at six. That was a wonderful question. So let's look at a question from Loving Dale. And forgive me, guys. I just need to check my phone. This is my pager. All right, so we're okay. And here's a question from Loving Dale. Question. When a neuro says your RMS is mild and doesn't put you on a DMT, with multiple relapses of optoneuritis in the past, for a mild case of MS, would a strong DMT be a good thing to consider? Wow, that's a really intense question, and thank you for asking it. So I have a very strong opinion that I want to bring a SWAT team to a knife fight if you're okay with a SWAT team. I want to put you on the single most effective drug that you're comfortable with. And I don't believe in mild MS because I, we're talking about brain damage. So if, if you only had one attack of optic neuritis, but you're blind in your eye and you were an airline pilot, you're out of work. And so that's not mild. Or if you are um, affected and your hand is a little clumsy, not a lot, just a little bit, but you're a concert pianist, that's not mild. My point here is I don't think that we should be so paternal and tell another human being, oh, excuse me, oh, that's no big deal. That's not that bad. Because to them, it might be really bad. And you don't have to be a concert pianist to want to maintain hand function. And you don't have to be an airline pilot to want to maintain vision. And so given that I can't reverse brain damage, I can't give you back what you've lost. Lovingdale, I want to put you on the most effective drug you'll let me to give you the best chance of doing well as long as possible. And that's my opinion. And I'll share with you, it is not the majority opinion. Most MS neurologists don't think like that. And I disagree with them. And it's not my fault that they're all wrong. I'm just joking. Um, it's really differences of opinion and it's different approaches to how we try to address the disease. Um, I have very strong opinions about how I want to try to address the disease. All right, what else do we have going on here? I've got Leslie Carisco. I hope I said your last name right. But Leslie asks a question from Texas. So hello in Texas. If one fails Limtrada 
and has a fairly elevated JC virus, is it safe to try one of the other two DMTs on the top shelf? So that's a neat question. So first of all, what does it mean to fail Limtrada? Well, I personally wouldn't consider taking someone off um, until I had finished the first two courses. So I'm just laying this out here. If you sign up for Limtrada, it's my expectation that we're going to do five days, wait a year, three days. That is an induction. So if you have disease activity in between that, we can't, we don't blame the drug. We just give steroids and then we give the second course. The question becomes if you have breakthrough disease and you, and you need further courses. And let me just talk about that for a second. If I've given you the two courses of Limitrata and then unfortunately you have an MS attack or unfortunately you have new spots on your MRI, we hit pause. That's the pause button. And then we think of one of three options. One option is do nothing, which if any of you have ever listened to me is not my style, but that's an option. A second option is to give a third round of Limtrada. And the third option is to switch drugs. And that is a very um, personal decision about whether you don't treat, give more Limtrada or switch drugs. So for the sake of the conversation, let's say that the group decision was that we're not going to give more Limtrada. So I can answer the question. But I will tell you that if you've done well and then you have an attack, I would probably discuss very seriously a third course. I have some patients that were having two attacks a year and they went on Limtrada. And then in year four or year three, they had one attack. And it was the first attack they had in years. And many of them opted to have a third course of Limtrada. We didn't view that as a failure because they had done way better than they had ever done. But for your question, let's say that you've decided enough is enough and we're not going to do any more Limtrada. I would look at giving one of the other uh, highly effective drugs. Yes, I would. And maybe one might gravitate towards Ocrevus because Limtrada is immunosuppression. And if you're JC virus positive, those two things are synergistic and increase the risk of PML. I'm not saying Tysabri is off the table, but I'm sharing with you that after you've given the Limtrada, if you're antibody positive, the PML risk in, um, in Tysabri is a little bit higher, or it's actually a lot higher, four times higher. And so that might drive us to consider Ocrevus. But, but there's other ways to think about it. And again, I really like what you're doing. You're saying, I want to stay in that top tier. If I'm no longer enjoying my Ferrari, I'm going to try a Lamborghini. I'm not going to go from Ferrari to scooter. So thank you for asking that question. Guys, we've been doing this for an hour and seven minutes, and I'm having a blast. Um, I want to thank all of you for jumping online and spending some time with me on a Friday afternoon. Uh, this is really fun. And so let's do a couple more questions. So uh, Megan, our moderator, is helping out. Megan, thank you. Um, and she's uh, got a question here. DMTs in pregnancy. Why not start on highly effective DMT from the beginning? Is Ocrevus chemo? Sorry if you already answered. Bad Wi-Fi connection. I hear you. Um, and so let's talk about pregnancy. Having kids is amazing. Um, I have two children, and they're the loves of my life, and I think that it, it, it strikes me that MS is a disease that typically presents around age 30, and so at age 30, many humans are either not done having children or they haven't yet had children. They're somewhere in that baby-making phase of their life, and so having MS puts a monkey wrench in that, or it can put a monkey wrench in that, and I think that you need to talk about pregnancy and family planning and desire for children the day you meet someone. And it's a discussion that you have to have before you consider a disease modifying therapy. And so let me briefly share with you a little bit about these drugs in pregnancy. And I'll start off by saying that the party line is not to be on drugs when you get pregnant. So that's the, the party line. And if you want to follow the party line, you can follow the party line. I'm going to share with you some modern thoughts uh, and, and some of what we're starting to do in clinic. So I have started to feel comfortable giving women on Tysabri the green light to get pregnant. And I have some patients who have opted to stay on Tysabri during conception and then during the, the beginning of their pregnancy. And we like to stop in the third trimester uh, for some particular reasons, but we keep them on uh, for those first two uh, trimesters. And that's something that's off label, meaning it's not part of the government label. And it's something that requires uh, the involvement of the family and the involvement of the obstetrician. And there's got to be a lot of talk and conversation 
Um, but the reason that we've done that with a couple people is when they came off Tysabri, all hell broke loose. And in the past, they've had devastating relapses associated with attempts at conception or after a pregnancy. And so we have a reason that we need to protect them and protect their brain against MS. And so that's a comment about Tysabri. Ocrevus is not a drug uh, that we have a lot of experience with getting pregnant on. It's very interesting that rituxan, which is another uh, B cell killer, has been studied, uh, has been looked at in lupus, which is another autoimmune disease. And in lupus, there's actually a literature that suggests that rituxan might be safe in pregnancy. But lupus and rituxan in pregnancy is not the same thing as MS and ocrevus in pregnancy. And I don't want to just borrow that data. Presently, I'm not comfortable with someone uh, staying on ocrevus when they get pregnant. Now, ocrevus stays in the human body after you take it for about four and a half months. And so the way that I would do this, the way I've done this is if you want to get pregnant, we give you the dose of ocrevus and then we practice conception with contraception. In other words, don't get pregnant yet. Um, use contraception for four and a half months and then we can remove the contraception and you can try to conceive. But you're doing it when you're somewhat not protected. And so we really, really, really want to get pregnant as quickly as possible. Limtrata is very interesting. Limtrata is only in the human body for one month. So a month after you've received Limtrata, there's no Limtrata in your body. And the label says that you can get pregnant four months after being on Limtrata. And so interestingly, we have used Limtrata in women who want to have a family, who want to become pregnant. Because it creates this really weird situation where you've been treated, and so the, the, the benefits are present, except there's no drug in your body. Because, again, remember that there's this durable effect in the absence of treatment. 50% of people went out eight years and never got retreated. And so it's a very interesting situation where you could conceptually or actually give a woman Limtrata, and then after her two courses, she can go ahead and get pregnant and do it knowing that she's protected in her MS. So that's very interesting. That was a great question. Thank you for that. Let's take um, another question here. I'm looking for another question. So this is not a question, uh, but it's something that we should touch on. It's another comment that, that Megan wrote. Um, and she said, insurance mandated that I fail two DMTs before approving Tysabri. And uh, that is a very uh, frustrating thing. That's called a step edit. Uh, and it's implemented uh, for reasons that are outside the scope of medicine. Um, it, maybe one day I'll do a complete live stream or a video on step edits. Um, it's something that I feel very emotional about. And it's very frustrating for me that uh, we would make the best medical decision for someone. And then an insurance company, for financial reasons, may tell us, well, you're not allowed to do that. And it's not because it, it, the, the doctor has evaluated the patient, looked at the MRI, talked to the human, figured it out the way that we did. They just said, well, we don't want to pay for that yet. Um, so that, that's, uh, I'll stop talking about it because I'll just get really riled up. Now, Matt writes that he loves the shirt. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am a child uh, born in the 70s, and I have fond memories of rocking some Pac-Man when I was a kid. And so that's kind of a fun shirt. So thank you, Matt. All right. One more question, then we're going to wrap up. If I can find. All right, here's a question from Mike. So Mike Freshette writes, in your practice, have you seen reductions in MS symptoms, such as leg stiffness and burning feet when on ocrevus? Yes, I have. I, I can't say that I see it consistently, Mike. Like everyone who goes on it has symptoms that resolve. But there is actual data in all three of the drugs, but the most robust would be an Ocrevus and Lemtrada of confirmed disability improvement, where people had improvements on their neuro exam. And as you're pointing out, sometimes symptoms melt away. Um, Mike, I'm gonna recommend that you check out a video uh, called Impro The Improvement Project. I did two videos, which I labeled The Improvement Project and then like this, uh, ver version two, where I discuss several cases in my own clinic where people manifested improvements, including things like burning pain going away, including things um, like having uh, less spasticity. And so I have seen that in my clinic. This has been an awesome uh, kickoff to the weekend. I want to thank all of you for jumping online. 
Um, I think at one point we had like 160 some people that were online and we've been chit chatting for about an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, there's been 114 thumbs up and I want to thank you for that. Uh, and as you jump off the live stream, go ahead and click that thumbs up if you like this video. Also, remember, this is a new format for me. So please give me some feedback. Do you like this format? Where I come on, we do some introductions, and then we have a discussion where I give a lecture on a specific MS-related topic, and then we open it up to questions about that topic. You know, in the community part of my, my page, my channel, I asked earlier today whether folks would like to have this style, this format, or the old format. The old format that I've been doing for a long time on live streams is an ask me anything approach where I just jump online and you guys throw out questions and I answer. And interestingly, it was almost a 50-50 split. So I'm going to jump onto my channel here while I've got you on the line so I can look and see uh, what the community said. So there were 133 people that wrote in and 56% wanted this format, which is why I did this today. And 44% actually voted for the ask me anything. And so the next time I do a live stream, I'll make sure that it's an ask me anything format. But please write in the comments whether you like this new format. And let me know if you have a preference between the two. I would love to hear about that. Also, remember, if you're willing to share, share with me your life goal. Share with me what you think about in the distant future that helps you level set why you're fighting, why you're taking a disease-modifying therapy. Is it because you want to climb Monte Picchu or finish your master's or get a promotion? Or is it because you want to walk your daughter down the aisle? So I would love for you guys to share that with me. My name is Aaron Boster, and, and I genuinely want to thank you for learning about MS with me. You know, I started this YouTube channel a couple years ago to help my own MS clinic patients learn between visits. It strikes me that if I'm meeting with you every three months and we're spending a half an hour, that's not enough time to really up your game the way that I want it to be. I need uh, to have more touch points to really educate about this chronic condition. And I think YouTube seems to be a really good format to do that. Um, it's my hope that, that you guys learn um, and you're empowered and educated and you're energized uh, by the content on this channel. And I'm trying to put out a video about once a week. Now, many of you have noticed that I had a video each day this past week. That's because I took a live stream and I, I chopped up the content and then I put them out as individual uh, videos. And so let me know what you think of that. Um, the analytics would suggest that you guys didn't love it. it. It didn't work as well as far as the numbers are concerned. But that doesn't mean that it wasn't valuable to you. So, so leave a comment and let me know if you thought that was interesting or not. And, and if you do like that, where I take an hour and a half long live stream and I chunk out small sections to make individual videos, I can certainly do that in the future. Until my next video or my next live stream, this is Aaron Boster saying thank you for learning about MS with me. And until next time, take care.